Hello and welcome back to another video with It's Dr. Dan and today we're going to be learning how to read a solubility table. Specifically this one is designed for students at my school where we use a very specific solubility sheet which anybody that here is allowed obviously allowed to use that's watching this um, but we're going to use that one in spe specifically. So what is it all about? So solubility is this concept of how when we throw an ionic salt into water it has the possibility to break apart now it all depends on the strength of the ionic bond and whether or not the water molecules that are surrounding it are strong enough to dissociate and break apart that bond so what is this exactly used for well what we're going to be using this for is a bunch of different skills that are really important in the introductory chemistry and in general chemistry so it's mainly used for determining solubility. So we're trying to figure out what the states of matter are. So we want to know, is it a solid? Is it a liquid? Is it a gas? So, or can we actually write that it is aqueous or putting an AQ after the chemical species? So then that's the, one of the most important things is can you figure out if that is the thing? Because that will tell you the net ionic equation of these different species. Now why is that also important is because that helps illustrate what the chemistry is that's occurring within the chemical reaction. Remember, chemical reactions are all about the chemistry of change. So you need to see like a new molecule being formed, something being created, and the easiest way for this to be illustrated is are we making a solid, a liquid, a gas when this is happening? That is one of the biggest things. So in chemical reactions, it's used a lot. This also helps illustrate oxidation and reduction reactions, being that this will help show you the charge of cations and anions. And it also helps you figure out this concept known as electrolytes, meaning that most of the ones in this table are considered to be strong electrolytes, meaning that they dissolve about 100% of the time, whereas weak is maybe closer to like 5 to 10% of the time dissolving. And non-electrolytes just means that, okay, we have this polar substance surrounded by a polar substance. This also helps us get a little bit of idea of colligative properties, which is essentially how many ions are in solution can really affect how, um, how they behave uh, when it comes to their freezing point, their boiling point, and some other properties as well. So we're going to dive into this. So let's take a look and we're, we'll go through some different examples of how this particular thing works in our chemistry course. So stay tuned and let's take a look. Our agenda today is to determine the solubility of a salt. Now, don't forget what is a salt when that is said. Well, the first thing you can think of is sodium chloride right? What you put on your food every single day. Salts are a cation and an anion bound together, meaning that you have a positive species binding to a negative species, so ionic characteristics. So when we're looking at these, what you're going to be using is in our course, we have the green sheet. I made a previous video on the naming component of the green sheet. This one is on the other side, the back half, which is on the solubility side. Now, what this thing looks like is essentially you see that there are two major columns here. The first one tells you has a list of cations and anions that are available in your whatever compound you have. And what this tells you is the different rule sets. So it's separated into two major parts. The top part is referred to as the soluble part. So how we read these is, let's say if I have sodium chloride as an example, and I want to know is, is it soluble in water? Well, the way that this works is you need to break it down into its two ionic parts, the cation and the anion. So if you can think, well, what is your cation? Remember, that was always written first. So we'll put Na+. Plus, and then next, you're going to put Cl- minus for the other part. Now, this is where the solubility chart comes in handy because what we're trying to do is see, does this happen or not? So the solubility chart will verify this. 
So what we're going to look for is either chlorine or we're going to look for sodium. And what we are going to look at this first is, all right, if I look at the very, very first part, I see group one elements, which is referring to the first column of your periodic table. We see sodium plus. So what this tells you is we'll then look at the entire column here. And one thing you'll notice up here, it says that it's usually soluble, okay? And, it, and it's soluble except when it's bound to one of these other elements. So being that we see sodium is right here in the middle, so that means it's soluble unless it's bound to essentially, well, okay, it says lithium is slightly soluble unless it's bound to carbonate, phosphate, and fluorine, and that's not the case. So that means it's, it's soluble. There's another way you can look at it too is via the chlorine side, which we see, okay, chlorine's right here. And what we can do is we see that chlorine is soluble, except when it's bound to silver, mercury, and lead. And being that's bound to sodium, and it's not one of those three elements, meaning once again, that it's soluble. So what we will do is we will write an AQ next to sodium chloride, meaning that it's going to dissolve and the way that it dissolves is it's going to turn into sodium and chlorine, okay? So it's something a little like that. Let's take a look at another example using our table. Okay, so our next example, we have silver chloride at the bottom of the screen. And what we're going to do once again is see, is it soluble? So what we're going to do is we're going to write both the cation and the anion components. So our cation is silver. And then the anion in this case is going to be chlorine. So what we'll do is we're going to look once again and see if we see either of those two elements to find out, is this soluble? Now, typically you're looking for the more common elements is what's listed on this table. So if you kind of look, you're not going to see silver anywhere on this list. And that's because it's a transition metal. It's a, it's a precious metal. You don't usually see it. But chlorine, right, it's a nion that's like in our, in our blood system, it's in our body, it's in the water that we drink. It's very common to find in solution. So once again, we see chlorine here, and it says it's soluble except for when it is bound to silver. Ooh, okay. So we have one, an exception. So what does that mean is that chlorine is always soluble except when it's bound to silver, mercury, or lead. So we can't write to this then. What we are then going to do is, okay, this is not going to happen. We can erase this here. And instead, what we are going to end up doing is putting a S next to our silver chloride. And what does that mean? It stands for that it is a solid. And in this case, it is a precipitate in the reaction. Okay, so it's going to, you're going to see this uh, solid that's going to Form when you are mixing this together. All right, so that's one way to read this. Let's look at another. All right, so let's look at a third example here. So we have ammonium hydroxide. So how exactly are we going to do that? Well, you got to remember your diatomics, right? The first one is NH4 plus, and we are going to be adding that to OH minus. Now, one thing about ammonium is ammonium is always soluble no matter what, but it's still good to always check this. So when we're looking at this, we see ammonium is on the top rule here. So it is going to be soluble. And it says except when bound to, well, it's only when lithium is bound to something. But we can also look at the hydroxide side to verify this as well. It should be the exact same thing for both. Now, the one thing is you will notice is that hydroxide is down here at the bottom. And this is where it's the insoluble area of the table. Okay, so usually these ones on the bottom are insoluble. So if this is to agree with what it said with ammonium, it should be an exception. So what we can look at is, okay, a hydroxide is insoluble except when it's bound to group one and ammonium. So what that tells you is that, all right, well, this is going to be soluble. And you can also see it up here, right, except when bound to ammonium for oxygen as well. So you notice how it's almost everywhere we see ammonium. It's a, it's a big exception rule. It's always soluble. So what we can do here is that we could further alter our, our 
um, formula. So we'll put a Q after all these species to show, hey, this is going to be soluble. So when we're writing our ionic equation, let's do another one. Next one is more just these next two, I should say, are just more to show you some of the basic rules about the solubility table. Not everything is going to be soluble, right? That's one thing we already saw is that some things will be solids. There are a couple others that you have to be aware of as well. One is your gases. So make sure you know your seven diatomic gases. So if you ever see them, which are, if you remember, have no fear of ice cold beer, which is hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, bromine, iodine, and chlorine. Um, so we see hydrogen and oxygen here. These are gases, so you never write them as aqueous. They are always gases. Now with water, water is a liquid. So when it, when do we write L's, right? Aqueous is also a, is a solution. L is a liquid, which is the same phase, but there's a difference. Liquid means that it's pure. Aqueous means that it's a solution made in water. So there is a salt dissolved in water, which is what AQ is. So it doesn't really make much sense to say water is dissolved in water. We just say it's a liquid. So we don't use the table for water. So keep that in mind for yourself. Write that down. It's really important to know. Same thing with your gases. You got to make sure you're able to denote solid, liquid, gas, and aqueous. Very important to understand what's happening. Let's look at another example just like this one. Okay, so here we have silver chloride and it's being formed. This was the one of the ones that we did earlier. It was our second example. So here I have where you have silver and chlorine are combining to make silver chloride. So chlorine, as I said earlier, is a diatomic gas. So we got to leave that label as G. Another thing is the difference between the ion and the metal version of it. So notice here I have silver and there's no charge listed next to it. This is extremely important to realize there is a difference. So if there's no charge and it's a metal by itself, it means it's the atomic version of it, meaning it has a charge of zero. It's not the ion. Okay, so this is not equal to a G plus. They are different from each other. Okay, so keep that in mind. They are not the same. So if you see just a metal sitting there in an equation by itself, it is the solid version. So you have a solid, gas, yes, solid in this equation. So you don't always use a solubility table all the time. You have to use judgment. This is designed for salt, meaning it is an ionic equation, right? So metal and a non-metal cation and ion bound together. All right. The last thing with your green sheet is that there are two different pieces that are included with it as well. So here I have one of them. The other is in my gas evolution video. But here I have there's a list of strong acids and bases that are here. The important thing to remember is that these are all considered strong electrolytes, which means that they're all soluble. OK, so these are very, very soluble. Um, and you can see that there's a note here that says that some of them are slightly, right, the group two elements are slightly soluble, but the rest of them are considered strong electrolytes. They fully dissolve. So all of these, let's say if I were to write like uh, HBr, for example, that's on the left list, this would break down to H plus and Br minus. All of these break down into their ion forms, and that's how we show all of this list. All right, so if you have one of them, they also break down too. All right. So thank you so much for listening. I hope this video helped a little bit. It was a little longer than I originally hoped for, but it's good to have this kind of information to help you be able to use the resources available to you in our chemistry course. Okay. Thank you so much. And please hit that like and subscribe button if you haven't, if you're new to the channel, and I will see you all later. All right. Bye now.